welcome to an episode of Coffee with Craner. Thank you all for joining us. And throughout the this question period, feel free, feel free to pop in a question in the comments and we'll see if we can get around to them. Today I have Richard Petty on the show. He is a University of Windsor business graduate, also the former president of Hostess, former president of Pillsbury, Canada, and also the former president and CEO of Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment. He's an active uh, retiree and he's been involved with the Amherstburg Community Foundation as president. He's also the co-owner of a new river bookshop headed to Amherstburg. So I am glad to have Richard on the show. And I also want to encourage any um, any emerging leaders watching the show to definitely check out two of his books. The first one is 21 Leadership Lessons. I've read this book and it has so many great tools to add to your leadership gym bag. Um, and I definitely recommend reading that. And then also Dream Job talks more about Richard's career at MLSE. Um, great stories in there. I definitely recommend checking that out. But Richard, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on the show here today. I'm pleased to be on it. Congratulations on this little enterprise. Uh, you've been busy attracting a lot of great speakers. So good for you. Thank you. And every show I, I start off with a question relating to coffee. I have to ask, where in Amherstburg is your favorite place to grab coffee? Well, that's an easy one. It's Caffeine and Company. Uh, I love the statement that they've made. Uh, you know, they went and spent some money on a really great interior. They deliver great uh, pastries. The coffee's terrific. Um, and people go to it. It shows that Amherstburg can handle bigger and better. So I'm thrilled with them. Awesome. Thank you. Now, talking a little bit about your your, your goal and, and setting goals, and specifically for youth and emerging leaders today, um, you wrote down in your in your dream job and a, a journal in, in university talking about that you wanted to eventually run a basketball team. Um, and I'm curious to know, what did you do specifically throughout your entire career path to make sure that that goal of running a basketball team, and you en eventually ended up doing it with the Raptors and leading MLSE, but I'm very curious to know what did you do throughout your career to make sure that that goal um, was achieved? Well, it was about uh, when I was about 20, University of Windsor Business School. I loved basketball. I loved the Pistons. Um, University of Michigan, Windsor Lancers were awesome those days. I sucked at it. I, I was not a good basketball player. So, so I loved the game. And um, one day I wrote in my journal, I was a big journal writer at that time, that I wanted to run a basketball team. So unbeknownst to me, I did something, first of all, really important. I had a dream. And whether it's a company as a dream or an individual, you have to have that dream. You have to have that vision. The second really smart thing I did was write it down. Um, and then, you know, so then I really followed a journey for the next 29 years. It took me to become the president of the Toronto Raptors. When I was writing my second book, 21 Leadership Lessons, I came across Jack Canfield, who wrote uh, Chicken Soup for the Soul. And he said, he, he said the very same thing that, that I did. I just didn't know it at the time. Have a dream, write it down, review it every day, and each day do something that moves you towards that dream. So what I did in those 29 years, um, I went to, I got a great degree at the University of Windsor Business School. I spent 19 years in consumer products, learning about branding, market research, sales, finance, leadership, HR. Uh, then I moved on to Skydome, ran that for four years, learned all about facilities, learned, worked with the CFL, Argos, um, the Blue Jays. Um, then I took a shot at bringing basketball to town. We brought it to basketball to Toronto and Canada, but my group didn't get it. Then I went to TSN Discovery Channel and I learned about producing games and, and doing news and launching Canada's first website for sports. So 29 years later, when they need a president, there's no one more prepared than Richard Petty, other than maybe Paul Beeston. No, I wouldn't say it. Paul Beeston was more prepared. That's exactly it. And you mentioned in your book, you talk about uh, getting your ticket punched. Is that something that, that you, you did? And is this something that you would encourage other leaders to do? Yeah, I consciously, I, I viewed it afterwards. And, you know, it's kind of an old analog saying when you get on a train or a bus and get your ticket punched. Well, young people like you don't even know that anymore. You, you swipe your uh, iPhone. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, consumer products. So I went to Colgate, General Foods, Pillsbury, I, you know, top brands. Uh, I was playing a little commercial ball at that time, still following the, the basketball. There were exhibition games in Toronto at Maple Leaf Gardens. So I had the dream front and center, but I knew 
I was picking up really good uh, packaged goods experience. When I interviewed for the Skydome job, the headhunter said, why should we hire you? You know nothing about running facilities. And I said, yeah, but I learned, I know about all these things. I learned the consumer products. The entertainment and sports business in 1989 did not do that stuff. I said, that's where the industry's going. And they hired me. And lo and behold, 30 plus years later, think about the branding and the sophistication of the NFL and the NBA and the NHL. The whole world has moved in that direction. So they hired me. I had four great years here as well. And, and then, you know, I, so I was getting my ticket punched in that. Uh, when I had that, we didn't get the team. Uh, Labatt's wanted me to run their broadcast division. So I'm learning one of the big, the number one revenue source for the NFL and the NBA is broadcast. So, so I'm learning how to do that. I did rights deals with the CFL, with uh, the NBA. And, um, you know, I talked to, I, I talked to our management team until launching TSN.ca when, which crashed the first night we put it on. <laughs> so I was ready. I got my ticket punched. Yes. And I also kind of want to bring up, like, there was a couple times where you did, I remember you were, you were asked to um, receive a job at leading, leading a team. I, I think it was Labatt and you, you turned it down because you specifically knew that there was another opportunity that you're looking for in the horizon. And you wanted to make sure that every single step that you took throughout your career would lead you to that ultimate goal. I don't know if you can touch a little bit on the yeah, job that you, you said, you know, no, you, you if your career is doing well, you get offered a lot of jobs. Mm -hmm. And I got, I started getting awareness. I was a very young vice president. I started getting press when I was 28, 29. So I was getting calls. I do have a, uh, I do have a rule that I learned when I was running Hostess, it was a $200 million company. Hostess potato chips no longer exists. Free to late about it. Uh, and I was approached to run Pillsbury Green Giant. And I said to the head hunter, uh, tell me about it. I said, what are the sales? And they told me, and I said, well, that's smaller than I've got right now. I want to be bigger and better. Yes. And he says, never turn down a job until it's been offered to you. And sure enough, so I, I took the interview, I prepared, I really pushed to get it. And in the end, they offered it to me. And if I had not done that, I would have missed a big move. Going to Pillsbury was a very big move because I was a divisional president at General Foods with Hostess, but Pillsbury uh, gave me a CEO's position. So um, yeah, there's jobs along the way. Uh, I looked at them and, you know, I, and I accepted one job and then turned it down. Um, I came real close a couple of times, but in hindsight, there's not a, I, I want to, every change I made worked out. I was lucky that way, I think. Yeah, no, it, it's great to know that every change that you did was to fulfill that, that dream and that goal that you constantly wrote down. But I do, you know, I give, I call something called forensic CVs where I look at a CV and I see how long the person's been working. Let's say they've been working 10 years and I count how many jobs they've had. And let's say they've had five. So my forensics here say they, they're changing jobs every two years. That is too quick. You have to go to a job and I don't mean you have to stay five, seven, eight years, but stay long enough so you can prove you've done something and you've picked up really relevant experience. And if you're hopscotching every year, two, three years, uh, your resume doesn't pass the smell test for someone like me. Yes, and and speaking of that, I kind of want to talk a little bit about vision and values that you touch a lot on in your in your book, and it's something that you constantly make sure is involved in any organization you're working with. But I want to fast forward to when you're president and CEO at MLSE, um, and I know there was there's an original vision and values at this company, and you ended up changing them. Why did you change them, and why are our vision and values so important? Well, a vision is the what you want to achieve as an individual and a vision. And as a corporation, what do you want to be? Uh, Pillsbury wanted to be the uh, Canada's best food company. Skydome wanted to be world's greatest entertainment center. Uh, MLS, he wanted to win on and off the playing field. Um, so what the what? And then the values are how you're going to do it. And, and values, there can't be eight of them. You know, at Pillsbury, there were three. At Skydome, three or four at uh, Maple Leaf Sports 4, they were the house. They, they were what we're supposed to do. They were the rules. We we're going to make every decision. And they're rock solid. You, they're not flavors of the day. Um, they're not new fashions. You should really stick with them. I remember hearing a story. Someone asked a, a president, how, how are you doing your vision and values? And he said, um, we're OK, but we've only been at it for five years. I mean, we were at it at MLSE for my whole time there. 
we made a little bit of change in MLSE. We added a fourth value dedicated to our teams. And um, we, we changed the vision a bit to winning on and off the play field. But it was essentially the same thing. We built that into how we recruited, how we trained, how we evaluated people on an annual basis. We are rewarded based on that basis. And I knew from empirical research we did with employees every year that over 90% of our employees knew what the vision and values were and followed them. I can remember I did a, a, a executive training there and the, the people had to write out the vision and values without looking. And I taught over 50 people that and everyone knew it off by heart. So it, it was, um, it, that's the one thing. It's a leadership thing. What I talked about is vision and values. Guess what? River Bookshop has a vision and values. What a surprise. You know that the Amherstburg Community Foundation as a vision and values. Yes, and how do you how do you find what the values and the vision would be, whether it be for yourself or an organization? Well, what happened with vision and values? They've been around since ooh, Walt Disney in 1955, Hudson Bay in the sixth, sixth, seventeenth century. Uh, you could there's a vision and values that have been out there a long time. Even the Bible says, "Those without a vision will perish." And believe me, I know that's about the only religious quote I know. Um, so they've been around a long time. They really, in about 1983, Peterson Waterman wrote a book, Search of Excellence. And they were able to prove empirically that companies who had better vision and values were more successful. It got to be the big thing. All the CEOs bought the book. Half of them read it. Uh, but the other, and now we're down to 50%. Half of them tried to do something, but it died. In the end, about 10 or 20% followed it. But through the 80s and early 90s, it was the number one management tool. So it's, it's out there and it's, it's something you can follow. In Pillsbury, when I took over Pillsbury, they had written their value, vision and values. I think they paid a million dollars to consultants to write their vision and values. And I looked at it, I'd read, read this book, I was at Hostess, I really wanted to try it. I get to Pillsbury, they've already written theirs. I look at it and go, I can work with that. So we made every decision based on that and we outperformed every division and, um, and I look back on the success we have, and I trace it to vision and values. Awesome. And just because we do have a couple of questions here that came up in the comments, so that if you're open to addressing them, sure. um, Mike Janice says That's here. a question I've never heard before. That's what I always challenge audiences. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think, I think you've heard this question often recently in the news. But Mike Janice says, what made you decide um, wanting to be an entrepreneur after you've retired? Well, I'm not dead. <laughs> I love books. I'm a bibliophile. I really believe that small towns should have independent bookstores. Um, I love the history of the town. We've um, we've hollowed out the history of the town for for parking lots. And here's a building that's 135 years old. It's it's eroding from the inside. It was a horrible shape. And uh, you know, I'm actively retired. I'm still pretty fit and got lots of energy and what the hell so i'm gonna put it in a bookstore awesome and the next one here comes from paul leecha he says throughout your long impressive career what is the most memorable interaction you've had with a professional player from any league or team hmm. i've never been uh big on you know i've only asked got one autograph in my life and I was never big on that. I don't have a lot of pictures of, and and I really respect the players. You could not get too close to them because you might trade them the next day. <laughs> Actually, one of the people I like the best, and, and I'm really hoping he'll, when COVID goes down and the border gets open, I'm no, I believe me, I'm in no hurry to open this border. Uh, a good friend of mine, Wayne Embry. Wayne Embry, I hired back a number of years ago. He was the first African-American general manager in the history of the NBA. He's an all-star. He's got a ring um, from a championship in Boston. He's in the Hall of Fame. He's a big bear of a guy. He's like 6'8". He's got hands like catcher's mitts. And he is a wonderful guy. And he's just a dear friend. And I, I just love him. And I was on the phone with him this week. And, and we've talked about he's going to come down and speak. And uh, he's going to speak about Black Lives Matter because he was the number one athlete in the state of Ohio, I think it was, and a high school athlete. 
And, but the number one university did not allow black players to play. So he went to Miami of Ohio, and then the rest was history Had a great career. His wife uh, marched at uh, the, the bridge, the Pettus Bridge, that's in the news right now because of John Lewis. His wife, Terry, marched that day, along with Oscar Robinson's wife, and got tear gassed. So this guy is the lived experience. He's, an, he's a wonderful human being. He's got this important message, and he's one of my favorites to this very day. Awesome. I mean, you know what I imagine? You've met so many, so many different athletes and, and professionals throughout your, your 11 years at MLSE and even before that. So it's great to hear all of those stories. Um, and, and in closing today, I just wanted to touch a little bit on the River Bookshop that's coming to Amherstburg. Um, I, I do encourage those watching to visit riverbookshop.com and sign up for their newsletter. There's going to be so many great speakers that are coming to the town of Amherstburg in the River Bookshop. Richard, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about who's coming up in the next year or so. Yeah, so obviously we're COVID's really affected things. We, we're in stage two down here. That means a groups of 10 only. Um, when we get to stage three, I believe we will. I hope we don't slip back. You're already seeing British Columbia, Alberta starting to slip back. Um, we can potentially get to 100. We will not, our, our first floor, which is our bookstore, will not hold that many, especially with social distancing. The second floor holds more, but still with social distancing. We are building in interactive video so that uh, I was meeting with the publisher, one of the publishers yesterday, lining up authors that that'll interact with the audience just like this and, and the audience will be able to ask them questions. So, so the authors were really waiting. I mean, Berkey's going to be there and, and Sean Fitzgerald's going to be there. Uh, um, oh God, bring tramps here. Yeah. Damien Cox has got one. So the books that are coming out and, and a whole bunch of authors that you know, on the forward list right now that are coming out. But what I'm really focusing on also is we want to be a real force in this town. We, we want to educate and inspire and um, engage the community beyond Amherstburg. We want to do it all of Essex County. So I'm bringing in Mike Schreiner, who's the president of the Green Party, talking about the climate crisis. I've got already four speakers lined up, including Wayne Embury, to talk about uh, social justice. I'm uh, Michael Hansberg, who was I was on his show off the record numerous times. I had so much fun on Michael's show. Michael says I've got to come. He's going to talk about um, uh, mental health. Uh, uh, Meg Reiner uh, from Marsh Collection is going to do a series of historic uh, updates on the town. Uh, we've lined up a strategy with Freedom Museum, the Black History Museum in time, to do Black History Month. So it's, you know, it's a third place. A third place, the first place is where you live. The second place is where you work. The third place is where you want to go with friends and family and feel engaged and learn stuff. We're going to be the best damn third place this area has ever seen. I, I'm extremely excited. And those watching, please, please, please check out their website, riverbookshop.com. Sign up for the newsletter. So many great things are coming to the Windsor Essex community, not just Amherstburg. So I, I'm really uh, fortunate to have you on the show today, Richard. Um, I, I appreciate your advice to today's emerging leaders. And if there are emerging leaders watching, please also purchase this book. There are so many great leadership lessons, more than 21. Richard said there's probably about 80 different uh, lessons in this book. And I really think will help help you grow throughout your leadership journey. So please check out the book and check out the website. And thank you for watching this episode. Just, just one collection. So the website yes. is just uh, kind of a blank page right now. It gets launched the day we open. But you can go on, as as Lyndon said, and subscribe to our on riverbookshop.com and subscribe to our newsletter. And it's important to get on the newsletter because there's going to be limited seating. So if I'm bringing in Brian Burke, you better get you better buy that ticket really quickly because it's going to be gone and the people on the newsletter find out a week before anyone else so please join us and as lyndon said please come down and see our our, our book read our book uh, sellers led by Lori whiteman yes Thanks, thank you richard thank you for joining and thank you for everyone watching this episode of coffee with craner <laughs>